Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Staff I Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Oh, disclaimer, y'all, we're having a hard time. I am having a hard, hard time. So this is why, as we are still celebrating all things Pride, that we decided to add another movie slash a cult classic to our episodes. And and honestly, we probably should should have done this like, like the first Pride Month. You know what I mean? Because it's yeah. such a classic when we were doing movies because it's such a classic that I kind of just, it wasn't in my thought process because I didn't, I didn't know it was a queer movie, by the way. I thought, I genuinely thought that this was a cheerleader movie. You, but you say that having not seen it. Having not seen it. Okay. Having <laughs> known, like, knowing <laughs> nothing about it. But what I'm talking about and what we are talking about this today is, but I'm a cheerleader, the 1999 slash 2000 classic, cult classic uh, movie that, yes, is a queer classic. Once again, I did not realize because it was during the era of all of those cheerleading movies and like girl movies that I really just thought it was one of those. So put it in there with, you know, Bring It On, um, Jawbreaker, like those types of movies that that's kind of what I saw this as. And so I did not realize until a few years ago how iconic this movie was for so many, especially like uh, a queer or lesbian you know, women who identify as queer, like this was something they saw as huge. And again, I did not know anything about it. I actually, we were talking about doing another movie and I'm like, what about this movie? And you were like, yes. (laughs) I was, I was. Um, Which a couple notes. Uh, We (laughs) might be doing Bring It On, which I have not seen. I'm I'm probably going to make you yes. Uh, Soon. I had never heard of it until we started doing... I had never heard of But I'm a Cheerleader until we started doing movies for Pride Month and it consistently showed up Mm -hmm. on the list. I can't say why I was always just kind of like, oh, we'll do this one instead. There was no real reason, but I knew it was iconic. And when you suggested it, I was... Very excited because I've been meaning to watch it. So I was like, oh, yes, now I can watch it for work. Yes. (laughs) So this is great news. (laughs) (laughs) But it was my first time seeing it as well. Yeah. And did you like it? I did like it. I um I know we'll talk about this. It is, yes, from the late 90s, early 2000s. Um I was expecting. I was there was definitely some stuff that hasn't aged well, but I was expecting worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I did. I really, I really did enjoy it, and I thought it was a very funny, bizarre thing that had a lot of commentary in it about gender roles. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be, but I liked it. Yes. It did when it first came out, like with so many movies we talk about on here. Uh, It got mixed reviews. Uh, In fact, when it originally was released, this movie got a 42% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and scored a 39 out of 100 on Metacritic. But the queer community was much more receptive to it. Uh, The film did receive awards at different international competitions and received a standing ovation at the San Francisco International Lesbian and Gay Film Festival. Yeah, so it's been, uh, it has since become known as a cult favorite for so many. You're going to see a lot of people writing about it, about how it changed their life or gave them a better understanding of themselves or had a moment of like, oh, this is refreshing. Uh, Many fans today still talk about its impact and how much it meant to them uh, to have a movie like this. In a blog written by Kay Birdo, I really hope I said your name right so sorry if I didn't uh, she talked they talked to fans uh, of the movie and asked what it was about the movie that was so amazing to them um, and here's some of the quotes that they got so one of the subject was it has a happy ending and the comment goes but I'm a cheerleader is by all definitions a rom-com and it comes with a requisite happy ending the fact that it follows the formula is deceptively groundbreaking There weren't a lot of depictions of queer romance back then, and lesbian characters were often subject to the barrier gay trope, i.e. they often ended up dead. As 
Carolina, 40 years old, pointed out, is one of the first mainstream films to show a positive ending in a queer film. I think about how before that, a lot of the lesbian relationships in films ended in death or someone going back in the closet. But that was the first to show the couple potentially ending up together and happy. Yes. Um, Some more quotes. This was the first movie I saw that was fully queer. Another theme that emerged is that the film is distinctly queer in its aesthetic, its writing, and its humor. For me, Thea, 38, wrote, but I'm a cheerleader is special for its aesthetics. The high camp aesthetic both mock straight culture, think the scenes where the kids are learning heterosexual roles, while creating a queer aesthetic at the same time. While most of the film is in the third-person perspective, it starts out with the audience looking through Megan's eyes, and she's checking out, bouncing boobs, and looking up skirts of the other cheerleaders, as Marissa37 pointed out. It's refreshing and funny, but really unmistakably queer. I'm hard-pressed to think of such a blatant depiction of femme, femme desire, without thought for the male gaze, even more than 20 years later. Megan and Graham's relationship is all about the two of them. There's no male gaze in play. There's no mention of men at all. Films that don't cater to the male gaze are, broadly, harder to find. And like in this case, often point to the director being a woman. So yes, the director, Jamie Babbitt, talked a bit about the complications of trying to get the movie out there, including getting the rating to be changed from NC-17 to R. She talked about her experience in a 2006 documentary, This Film Is Not Yet Rated, and how it seemed that the industry was more harsh on the film because of its queer content, as well as showing suggestive scenes around female sexuality. She went on to say that she felt that the movie was discriminated against because it was a gay film. Uh, Yeah, so with all of that in mind, let's jump into the plot. Uh, The movie begins with Megan, played by Natasha Leone. We all know her and love her. An all-American cheerleader who seems to have it all. A jock boyfriend, religious parents who love her, and good friends. Cameo of Michelle Williams here. Uh, But it turns out that all her family and friends are concerned that she is a lesbian. With an intervention with the help of counselor from True Directions, Mike played by RuPaul Charles. Yes, that RuPaul. Uh, They all confront her with evidence, including her becoming a vegetarian, tofu, and listening to Melissa Etheridge, obviously. Uh, Soon, she is shipped off to the conversion camp of True Directions, where she is introduced to the owner, Mary Brown, played by Kathy Moriarty, who is of like the 90s fame. If you've ever watched any films in the 90s, you've seen her. The camp is a haven of all things stereotypically heteronormative and gendered, with the aesthetics of the blue and pink to represent the feminine and masculine that is expected of the respective genders. The camp has become the answer to Megan's perceived identity crisis. Soon she meets the rest of the campgoers, including Graham, played by Clea Duvall. We love her as well, 90s icon. Um, Hillary, played by Melanie Linsky, who we also love in so many things now. Yes, including The Last of Us. And he got very excited. <laughs> Dolph, uh, played by Dante Basco. You will also know him from the 90s film Rufio. Rufio. That was him? Yes. Oh, wow. Come on. And then several <laughs> others. On day one, Megan finally realizes that, yes, she, in fact, is a homosexual. And the whole crying scene happens. Uh, and she begins her journey to, quote, recovery, of course. But throughout her time there, she soon develops feelings for Graham, who shares those feelings as well and soon begins a relationship. And while Megan soon begins to embrace those feelings, Graham tries to deny them as she's scared of the disapproval of her parents, her father. After a night of adventure with XX gays, former uh, campers of two, two directions that re- realize, no, nah, this is not working and I want to be who I am. Graham and Megan get closer, but soon they are caught and must either do a simulation, sexual dissimulation with Rock, Mary's son, or be kicked out. Megan chooses to not do the simulation and chooses Graham as she sees it and is soon kicked out, but Graham decides to stay and graduate the program on her father's behest slash demand. Soon after, Megan, with her new crew of XX gays, go back to rescue their people, including Graham, and after doing, a, like, after being rejected the first time round, and then doing a new cheer routine just for Graham, they run away together. And then we also get to see Megan's family join a group of parents with gay children. It was very sweet. Kind of. It's like alcoholic anonymous, but for... 
parents of gay children. <laughs> but I think it was like a support group as in like yes. how to support their, fa- their, do- their, yes. their lesbian daughters rather than like, you know, how to deal with them. But yeah, so that's essentially the entire plot. And yes, this is one of those early 2000s, 90 campy movies that we would talk about with like the tongue-in-cheek uh, dialogue and sense of humor that we would also talk about for um, Bring It On, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You, which I've also made you watch, and several of those movies. Clea Duvall was also in The Faculty. Yes! Yes, and she, that's that same level of camp that we're seeing in this, uh, except even higher. At, at one point, like, critics really called it, like, a watered-down John Waters version of a queer movie. So they had a lot to say because they they were not on board with the over-the-top satirical level uh, that we see. But obviously, it has held out well for so many. Yes, it is one note stereotypical uh, identities of, of gay people, essentially, is what they're doing without any mention of any other queer people. There's no real, like, bisexuality in this conversation. There's no conversations of trans, even though I think there may have been an underlying, like, yeah. character representation. We'll come back to that. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely, like, it wasn't as bad as some of the other movies. Yeah. And like, ah, this is not aged well. I feel like they did so well in being satirical. It ha- doesn't feel as offensive. I say this as a straight person, so I can't really say that. But in my, in my like, I didn't cringe as much. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, as I said, I was really worried about it just because when you watch something from the 90s, so much of our conversation has shifted. And there was definitely like a language we don't use anymore, but it was used back then. And it was mm-hmm. used in a way that was clearly meant to be like oh it's bad they're using it right and it was like there were some very strong very strong uh stereotypes of like how certain i mean the whole it the whole joke of like oh she's a vegetarian and all yeah the, but it, but then like there were just some like showcasing of how gay men act and stuff like that. But it right. was, I feel like it was meant to be played of like, yeah, we know this is a stereotype. This is what you think, that how gay people act. Right. But it, sometimes I was like, oh, well, <laughs> I don't know right. how to feel about this. Right. <laughs> like, are you joking or are you not joking? Yeah. And of course, again, Jamie Babbitt has spoken quite a bit about what she wanted to do and, and her purpose in this and making sure that she made it so ridiculous that it would be almost impossible to not note that it's sarcasm, as well as the fact that, yes, the jokes were mainly more around heterosexual people than about, and the, and the gender norms, than about the queer community. Like, she wanted that flip very evident. Um, I think she did a good job. So with that, we're going to talk a little bit about, about the themes. Obviously, the, one of the biggest themes is, I guess, coming out, because that level of, like, her going, I'm a homosexual... <laughs> yeah that entire like it was so cringe but now that I'm replaying it in my head and saying it out loud it is quite funny it's one of those like moments of like I'm sure so many queer people will say that line in that context yeah but I'm like okay that's ridiculous but it was one of the bigger conversations because each one of them have the idea which is a very, like, even though it, was, it is funny and ridiculous, it's true. The root story that they try to look into to talk about what caused you to be gay. What caused you to be gay? Which was this level of, like, what the hell? And and having that gender norms and stereotypes as a part of that conversation as well. Because we talk about Megan seeing when her father lost her job and so her mother had to be the breadwinner and that caused the root. And that seeing her dad being emasculated made her yes. like... Which are not her words. Yeah, no, these are but... not her words. These are according <laughs> to them, the the conversion right. people, um, Mary herself in their counseling moments and like making sure that they blame something for their queerness or for their homosexuality. We have that moment of him talking about seeing men changing in locker rooms and that changed them. And they're like, no, that's not good enough. You can't, that happens all the time. That's too normal. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> 
You can't you can't beat this. It has or, to be trauma. <laughs> some type of trauma. I think another one's like, you're you got molested. Duh. Obviously that was your beginning, which is again that flip on the head in that conversation of like, okay, this is not a thing. It's just more of like they were always this way and or their sexuality is fluid and it doesn't matter on this cut like ideal of like, where's the beginning? <laughs> What's the root cause that we need to dig out of you? Um, so that was an interesting conversation. And then we go to the people who have truly accepted it and loving themselves and figuring this out and realizing this is not a sin. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. It reminded me a lot of the recent episode we did with Joey on bottoms. Mm -hmm. But it is one of those things when I was watching it, I was like, it's depressing in the sense that this is true. Uh, like, having this sort of intervention where's your trauma where, where are we gonna deroot it and you're gonna be straight again you're gonna be normal and that's what you should want right but it was kind of funny to see it lambasted like this yeah where it's clearly ridiculous as you said the director was clearly like no this is so silly and it's i know we're going to talk about this in a second but i did really enjoy the um accidental turning on of everybody. <laughs> like you're putting them in activities that are like kind of sexual. <laughs> right. Like this is where I'm like, well, I'm attracted to this. So let's watch this as they demonstrate this. So let's go. It was, yeah, that was hilarious. Mm -hmm. With that, of course, we come with the theme of the stereotypes of queer people. Yes, she definitely wanted to play that up. I will say I found it interesting and not that it matters. And I think we've come back around in this conversation of like not outing people for the sake of inclusivity. Like there's such a fine line because, we, you know, like not too long ago, we had the young actor. People were like really upset that he played a bi character and everybody was like, he's straight, he shouldn't be this character. And then, and then he had to be like, well, not that this matters, but I'm, I'm uh, bi, but thanks for making me do this on the time that wasn't my time. You know, and, and I have a big conversation about like whether or not we have as an audience the right to question and make people come out. But in this level, like because this is a 1999-2000 film, since then, I do if I, I know Natasha Leone has like she's been a queer icon and has all has been since this movie, if not before, I believe. But I think she is for the most part straight. Um, I know that the dude who played Rock, who is obviously the reason that Mary Brown wants this conversion therapy, trying to convert him, which is why they make him do the stim simulation so much, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, nah, I'm good, but you do you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But I know that he is married with a wife and all that. Not that he's not. But I wonder what those thoughts and thought process were. Like, did they truly look into seeing, like, having it heavily laid? Um, I know that, as far as I know... Dante Bosco is kind of in that same line, has a wife and family and never really talked about being homosexual. So I wonder, outside of like RuPaul, who uh, like she, apparently they originally wanted Arsenio Hall to play that character, but he turned it down because he did not want to play a gay person. So there's this like level. And yeah, apparently they also had um, Rosario Dawson audition as Megan Bloomfield. But they wanted a white person to represent all American. So she really had to fight to, she did, she did talk about this, having more people of color in their set. Like she had to fight with uh, the executives. She said that it, essentially the entirety of this film was trying to fight to have inclusion and have, having different people and all of that, as well as being able to show like kissing among uh, same gender people without it being too racy and being uh, being stretched to NC-17 for that. I think like the things that she had to cut out were like they had to like cut down the makeout scenes uh, that had to cut down where uh, she touches like over the clothes or something. And then uh, like her even mentioning that she uh, had oral sex with one of them, like had to cut that line out. It wasn't even a scene. It was cutting that line out in right. order to get 
the R rating. So the, the level of like ridiculousness that she had to stretch in order to get this movie made was beyond. And like if this was about heterosexual people, which of course this wouldn't exist, there are movies like this, like the campy movies with heterosexual people with this level of sexuality that are also R rated without any troubles. So it's kind of that level yeah. of like so much discrimination in this. But with that, yes, the stereotypes of different queer people in here, I'm coming back, uh, in here was so relevant. The one thing that many of the people were talking about was during a time where the stereotype that lesbians were all butchy. Yeah. They had a cheerleader being the main role of being the lesbian. And, like, and, the, and then in the end, the proud lesbian, the one proud lesbian. <laughs> yeah out of the group um and i found that yeah they're like yeah yeah that was that whole point because she does say that but i'm a cheerleader i obviously i'm not i'm just really happy and to be fair when they said that the because the dude the boyfriend was like you know i think you're gay because you don't like to kiss me i'm like uh who would he was a terrible kisser (laughs) we have encountered two cases of terrible kissing (laughs) within like a week samantha And I'm like, you know, like, you definitely, that's definitely not the evidence, even though she is. But I'm like, uh. Yeah. I love how quick he was to be like, she must be. It can't be me. (laughs) And then also that kind of comes to the conversation of like people thinking that's normal. Because Michelle Williams is like, I think it's fun. I'm like, yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, unless you kiss like that too, like you think that's... mm, it was gross. It like, was... and it happens early on, and I recoiled physically. Yeah, as you should. As does, <laughs> as does she. As does Megan. As she starts yes. wiping off her face. She's like, don't you hate when they do that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's but gross. yeah, that, so like the stereotypes of queer people. But then we have, I thought one case was interesting. We have Jan, who who is fairly masculine. Like They've they've got a mustache and they have the mohawk and, and they, they, you know, dress down. And she, she ends up being the one like, no, but I'm straight. She's like, I do like penises. So like, I don't understand why I'm here just because I look this way. Y'all are assuming. And then RuPaul's like, yeah, but look at you. Come on. Come on, yeah. you're you're gay. Um, and then I thought maybe this could be a stretch. Like, does she represent trans trans people? Like, maybe she's a trans man that still loves men. Like, which we've seen is obvious. Yeah, that happens all the time. That's a thing. What we see trans women still loving women, like all these things. And so, like this kind of level of conversation, even though she's not, she doesn't say she's trans, and it's not, it's not noted that she is trans. Yeah. I just wonder if that's like. A representation they wanted to throw in there without executives getting too like, uh, no, we can't have that type of represent- representation on here. Like, yeah, I, I'm wondering, and I'm, I'm wondering, maybe there's an article out there. Anybody, anybody? But I thought that was an interesting addition to that. We have again, uh, Rock, who is the hypersexual, but hy- like level of, I guess, somewhat she's trying to make him masculine, get on the roof to fix it, stop drinking with a straw, chug it like a, all of these things. I was like, what is what is happening? <laughs> all of those levels. Um, we gotta love the fact that when they do go dancing, um, the character of Andre, like you see him wearing the boa and the very feminine outfits, which is fine but like of course it's kind of like yeah this is the stereotype it's like an over the top stereotype we do have a 90s goddess julie delpy in this role like she doesn't have a name except her character's name is lipstick lesbian who's at the bar gets uh (laughs) megan to dance which has a lot of controversy because she made a lot of statements pretty disparaging the statements when it comes to like (laughs) inclusivity in the film industry, so I'm like, why would you do that to yourself? You are ridiculous, but okay. But she was, in the 90s, one of the uh, heyday uh, women leads, so she had a very quick cameo here as well, being a lipstick lesbian, which, again, I love that that's her character name. (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. Which is a stereotype once again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There were definitely some some extremes, which, as we've said, I think it was meant to be uh, extreme, but kind of like the uh, 
panicked high scream run um, <laughs> from Andre, I believe. And then, wait, yeah, because that's sort of the whole thing they were doing was this very gendered, very specific. This is what men do. And right. This is what women do. Right. So I do think it was purposefully done. But right. I was, it was kind of like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> We're going for it, okay. Yeah, and yeah, coming back to, they had the stereotypical gender norms. Like, they really wanted to point out the ridiculousness of what they found was normal and that that would equate to making you heterosexual, essentially. Women being able to scrub and clean, vacuum being taught to... uh, all all of those things to please the men, even to the point when they were having the simulation and Mary Brown says, no, four plays, not necessary. The men need to get in and get out, load up, load, drop his load and get out. I was like. <laughs> and Rock's like, no. <laughs> even he was like, uh-uh. No. <laughs> because oh, that was like, what, the, what just happened? Like, that was to the level of, like, she even fed into that stereotype of, like, you're just supposed to copulate and move on. Like, there's nothing, it's not about the women at all. Don't worry about it. Again, the chopping of the wood scene, quite hilarious. As well as uh, the the football scene, which I could have gone completely different. I was waiting for, like, the hijinks to happen when they tackled each other. It yeah. didn't. So I was very, very, very surprised. Yeah. So essentially, for anyone who hasn't seen this, it is like the most... <sighs> the aesthetics of it are very blatant. It's like all pink here where the women are. The men are in all blue. Even their outfits. Yes. And then they're learning these activities that are gender norms. So like for women, it is cleaning and cooking. I think Mary Brown says something like, by the time he gets home, you've yeah. got to have dinner ready and he's tired and he needs all this. And, and the men are learning like sports and army, like combat. Kind <laughs> cars. of. Cars. Cars. <laughs> and I like that they are all fake cars. Like, yes. did you, like well, again, this is that aesthetic. It's like, it's not quite real. Um, and I can think that kind of gets into, I guess this is not a theme necessarily, but it's definitely the main plot. Like, it is definitely the driving force. Uh, it is the uh, scenario, uh, essentially. And that is the conversion therapy. And, you know, we, we have this conversation. We've actually had episodes about conversion therapy. We've talked about the level of conversion therapy. We've talked about it as a, because it is, uh, Christian nationalist ideal and this was like beginning with them and and the whole level of um we can convert you by doing these things and some of the things that they talk about when we talk about it today and when we talk about in its real context is really really dark and really disturbing and abusive but one of the things that they use is the electro shock therapy which is not which kind of just looks like a vibrator yes which one of the uh, lesbians use that because she says pain I love pain like mm-hmm. <laughs> and so she would often use it mm-hmm. at night uh, and they they this talk conversation of like you use this to stop your impure thoughts we have the main character Megan doing her prayers essentially her her sayings and chant Christian chants we're gonna say it that way is that that is what it is sorry y'all um but it, and in order to try to stop these thoughts and the impure thoughts, um, in order to do that with, again, the electroshock therapy, they put them, when they sin or do something wrong, they, like, hide them in the doghouse, like, lock them in the doghouse, which, again, were made, obviously, within the movie to make light of it. But in actuality, these things, the, there was a lot of accusations of these things, that simulation that occurred, you know, they would... Um, inundate them and brainwash them with porn and all of these different things. They brought in prostitutes or sex workers in order to convert men. Like, there's so many levels within all of these things. But of course, again, they're trying to talk about the ridiculousness of this, of this simulation. What the f*** is this supposed to do? Like, nothing. Nothing except for cause more trauma and damage. Uh, what does this do with these counseling with their parents except for, again, more trauma and judgment? Uh, outside of that, as well as like the cl- cooking and cleaning, it teaches them to lie and hide things better, um, to fake 
all of these things. Again, kind of like how Graham says, I'm attracted to so-and-so now, who is the dude. And she's like, I have a crush on him. And they're like, oh my God, it's working. And in actuality, no, it's not. She's <laughs> lying to get out of this um, because she is so miserable. Yeah. Something that stood out to me too is, um, again, this was trying to really showcase how ridiculous all of this is. But there were a lot of themes that we know are true of like, I'll kick you out of the house. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't work, I'm paying so much money for this to work. You won't get anything from me, from their parents at these meetings. And that's one of the reasons Graham was so at the end trying to get it to get her parents to at least believe it, um, that it had worked. But that is a real thing, like that kind of controlling, holding that uh, a house and uh, food and all that over you based on something that I would agree the movie did a great job of being like, this is pretty silly, isn't it? (laughs) Right, right. I think that's exactly uh, that level of conversation. We also have... um, Again, like with the family ties, all of that, the level of trauma that we see. Yeah, Graham being told that that's what, like she's being like her mother, apparently. Apparently the mother had ran away with a woman is what it seemed to imply. And so, again, that was her root story as well. That this, you know, if you did this, not only have you lost your mother, you'll lose your father too, which is what we see a lot. And then at the end, when um, they don't succumb to this ideal they're just kicked out and like, you have nowhere to go. Bye. Um, and I think that's that other com- conversation. It's like that we see that way too often. At least they made this a happy ending with the parents really figuring it out. Okay, we need to look, take this as a different route. Uh, Megan's parents, that is. Everybody else we don't know. Because the entirety of this is the parents wanting to fix their children. And then that includes Mary Brown, who wants to fix her son, but she's kind of given up, I think, but trying to make him a part of this community as well. And he just doesn't care. Nope. (laughs) As he dances about. Um, But yeah, I think that's this whole ideal of like, okay. And again, the early 2000s, late 90s, conversion camps were coming into conversation more and more and more because people were starting to be like, "Mm, do, do we think this is good? Wait, wait, of course, they, and they're still in practice today. There are camps still open today. We've talked about this. They are still being funded by many of the fundamental um, Christians and organizations, conservative organizations, um, and they are also the same people who are trying to gut these policies uh, for queer rights, um, especially against so many, including the trans people. I do have that level of like, yeah, I think the newer, I don't know if we could have a new version of this type of comedy. I think like maybe we have aged out of these comedies, meaning like it's not surprising anymore. So because this this was revolutionary at that time to take this and take this as a satire and then to bring it out and to allow for public displays of affection for, and I say public as in like on film, for uh, same-sex relationships, as well as the fact that it's not, as one of the of quotes, it's not in a, a male gaze, necessarily, um, as well as the fact that this is not for hetero cis people. Like, this is for the queer community, point blank, with the hopes that people will start questioning these things. I think the fact that it wasn't played necessarily for sexuality but it was still sexual but also it wasn't while it is a comedy the the relationships between them wasn't the funny it wasn't played for laughs right that they were attracted to each other because like everybody at this place that was supposed to be quote reformed was attracted to someone else of the same sex at this place and it like there's comedy around that but it wasn't played we're not laughing at them. Right. So I think that that was a very refreshing thing. And I, it just felt to me, it was nice that it was almost like 
and I know I'm coming way later, but for me watching it now, it was nice. It was almost like not a big deal in it. It was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, that's it's a rom com. Yeah. It was expected <laughs> that they would be together. Like you were rooting for them to be together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You wanted them to end up together. And they had their kind of like ups and downs, but then they ended up together. And going back to our conversation we had with, um, we had about the term mother the other day, I did think it was interesting that there was sort of this like XX gay, here's where you go. Right. If you've got nowhere else to go. Right. Who also, like I wanted to add this, was one of the best examples of relationships when they had a moment of being like short with each other. Yes. And then, like, acknowledging it and then having Megan be like, what? Like, to see <laughs> confrontation, but then to see them make up and then, then just move on. I was like, I love that. I love that they <laughs> added that scene uh, for the XX gays, Larry and Lloyd uh, Morgan, Morgan Gordon is who they were. And, like, coming in to seeing that from being chastised constantly and then just telling each other to shut up. Essentially, Mary Brown telling everybody to shut up that they disagreed with her. And to seeing these two having a moment, talking it out, very split second, and then moving on. It's like, oh. She's like, what? What? Oh. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, I like that. It was just a short clip. But yeah. it was significant <laughs> enough. I was like, I like that they portray their relationship in a healthy manner, as opposed to what we see oftentimes where it becomes all kinds of scattered. Um, and they're like, it's so dramatic. And da 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 But, like, we see them being like, no, this is normalized. This is normal. This is a relationship. And this is how you get through those tough times. And in any relationship, it can be both ways. Yeah. Yeah. I liked that too. And it was especially nice because there is a scene we didn't talk about um, where Megan sees two of the guys uh, kissing. Mm -hmm. And like, it was like, ooh! Yeah. And reports them. And it just felt like such a betrayal even if at this point she's still trying to graduate and fit in and like do all of that uh so it was nice to see sort of her coming around to that camaraderie right support yeah i I thought that was an interesting thing too because especially with graham being so like this right um and then at the end still wanting to graduate and megan being like well (laughs) <laughs> I'm gonna go all in. I'm gonna rescue <laughs> I'm gonna you. Really go for it. Uh, yeah, I really yeah. liked it. Yeah, I did too. I now know why this is a <laughs> <laughs> classic in general. Because <laughs> I was like, uh, uh, okay, okay. Again, like I said, at that point when I first, I didn't. I guess I said, I guess I didn't watch the preview well enough. Or they, they the previews, I'm sure, during that time, they didn't put any content that showed a relationship for same-sex gender. I'm I'm almost positive the previews would just have been her doing that cheerleading thing and then her yeah. going into the hijinks. And, like, so I assumed it was just a cheerleading movie. Yeah? Completely unbeknownst to me at that time. <laughs> I'm like, okay, moving on. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not really sure why I didn't watch it because, obviously, I like Bring It On. <laughs> I am honestly fascinated. I would love to hear from listeners who saw this when it came out. But again, going back to that conversation we had with Joey about Bottoms, I'm kind of surprised this got made. Yeah. And when I was watching it, I was like, and that made me kind of sad because yeah, it's like you said, it's not explicit. There's nothing about it that is overly sexualized or anything like that. Yeah, there's no nudity. There's barely any language. No. Like... I think it's got a rated NC-17. I think it's just because it's not from a male gaze because in the beginning, like you said, there is the shot of cheerleaders, but it's from her gaze. Right. And th- right. if that was in another movie that was from the male gaze, that would not register at all. all the time. Yeah. But because it was her... And her being like, oh, maybe I like women. This is, I mean, honestly, yeah, it's kind of bizarre to me. It's rated R. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I honestly had assumed it was because PG-13 was rare. Yeah. But I mean, it still existed. Yeah. 
I mean, it started in, like it was created in 1984, so it has existed for over 15 years. I don't understand how. It, anyway, that's the whole again. This that bigger conversation of like what gets what, and why. Adding on, there was a musical in 2006 based on, but I'm a cheerleader. So I do love oh. that. <laughs> Just an FYI, everyone. I bring it on. Which is a 2000 film, so it was in the same year. It was PG-13, and they actually talk about fingering. <laughs> legitimately and there's a scene where he's fingering her while she's in a cheerleading pose i was gonna say i bet it's that there's discussion hints of masturbation i bet that's a big reason why but i'm a cheerleader is rated and R. there's so much language in P- like bring it on i don't know if the f word is in there but i know they say all the other <laughs> offensive words yeah yeah, that's interesting. I actually didn't know it was rated R. Uh, I would not have guessed. I so. wouldn't have guessed that either. But anyway, that's that bigger conversation, 2000s and where we are today. Although that's still level of like outside of like bottoms and all of that. We still see very much the Barry or gay tropes a lot, a lot. And then sexualization instead of just like relationships of gay relationships or uh, queer relationships and st- you know like that's that's the whole thing as well but yeah this movie was quite uh refreshing i'm sure i would have been in sh- i might have i may have known i would have been in shock by this movie in 2000 because you know i was very much in my church ways <laughs> even though yeah. still then i was like this doesn't make sense because i've definitely met you know mm-hmm. queer people who are obviously like they have and always have been mm-hmm. and they're happy or when they like admit that so i knew that in 2000 so i don't know who knows how i would have <laughs> re- reacted i would have been i would have been quite surprised um but i don't think i would have been like this is gross or anything i think i would have been like oh it makes sense to me it just makes sense to me <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah I can see that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did see, oh, I did see, I had seen other movies where women kissed. And I remember it being like, oh, it must be so sexual and wrong. And I was just kind of like, mm, I don't know. Just kissing. Yeah. <laughs> I think my mind always went to, which is very like narcissistic of me to be like, huh, that's not for me. Yeah, co- am I like questioning? <laughs> like, yeah. why don't I find that attractive? Like, I'm actually sitting there going, "Huh, I guess I don't. I guess I'm not get-. like questioning whether or not I find mm-hmm. that attractive." Is mm-hmm. it's uh, this level instead yeah. of being like that's gross, just internalizing it to myself, like attaching it to my own reactions. Yeah, uh, I mean that makes sense, and I think like the importance of the who's telling the story and the gays because the gays sounds like I'm saying the gays Uh, (laughs) like the the fact that it's not male gaze based is very important because so many times our popular media does really sexualize not even lesbians just women kissing yeah Um, so I think for this movie I would go with that this is definitely much more geared towards women like this is a f- like feminist movie for that route, of like allowing their own conversations, allowing their own like romance, with everybody else being supporting characters, which is lovely. Yes, um, I enjoyed it. I'm glad we got to watch it. Uh, <laughs> I am too. <laughs> I was very excited when you suggested it. I was very very excited because just um, like you said, it was like the top ten. Like, why have you not watched this type of movie? consistently shows yeah. up. Yeah. And it's it's screening around Atlanta right now. Oh, is uh, it? Uh, yeah, they got the, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mhm. They can iconic. It yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listeners, if you have any thoughts about this movie, uh if you saw it when it came out and were shocked or not shocked or whatever you thought, uh please let us know. You can email us at stephydmomstuff at iheartmedia.com. We also have a new email address we're testing out. Either way, it'll get to us. But the new email address is hello at stuffonevertoldyou.com. 
Uh, you can find us at Twitter at MomStuffPodcast or on Instagram and TikTok at Stuff One Never Told You. Uh, we're also on YouTube. We're on T Public, and we have a book you can get wherever you get your books. Thanks, as always, to our super producer, Christine, our executive producer, Maya, and our contributor, Joey. Thank you. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, you can check out the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your favorite shows.